I'm Julie Grobe, coordinator of digital projects and instruction for special collections at the University of Houston Libraries. I want to welcome you to a screwed up history. This event is brought to you by the UH Libraries, African American Studies at the University of Houston, and the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Pavilion uh, Center for the Arts. Um, this is a part of a larger conference already, the Houston Hip Hop Conference, which is also presented by the HERE Project at Rice University. Um, and that's the group that brought us the great opening reception last night with the graffiti artists and b-boys. So I know we have some people today who are here to learn about hip hop and don't know that much about it. And um, you guys are going to learn a lot. We have some people who know everything about hip hop, everything about DJ Screw. They have that unreleased personal tucked in their drawer somewhere. Um, and I hope that those of you who are here will see the music that you already love in a new light. So from the beginning, when I proposed this conference, one of my goals was to bring people together, rappers, scholars, and fans. And judging from our registration list, we've done that. We'll have students here today from the University of Houston, Rice, TSU, Houston Community College, UT, Texas A&M, Sam Houston State, Prairie View, and the School of Hard Knocks. Among our audience, we have students, professors, librarians, DJs, rappers, producers, artists, screwheads, fans, and one self-described music connoisseur. We have guests here from Houston and the surrounding areas, but also people coming in from Austin and San Antonio, and some people from out of state, uh, Louisiana, Tennessee, North Carolina, California, and New York. So another fun part about looking at the registration list um, was seeing uh, some of the names of people who registered. So we'll have people here with us today who are big, lil, skinny, short, gold, purple, black, jazzy, bossy, and badass. So I want to welcome all of you. So how this is going to work is we're going to have four panel discussions throughout the day. And um, in, before each discussion, we'll have um, a speaker, either a scholar or journalist, who will give a 10-minute introduction to that topic. And then we'll turn to a panel of people, mainly rappers, um, to answer questions from the speaker about that topic. So the idea is that we'll really have an in-depth conversation. It won't be like one of those quick interviews that you, know, you see on YouTube. Um, we'll really talk about the history and culture of Houston hip hop. Uh, during the middle of the day, we'll have a DJ set by Lil Randy. Um, so we'll have some music. I'm going to ask people now, probably ask this a few times, but if you could set your phones on silent, that would be great. Because I'm going to give a little presentation. So I want to give just a super quick background on Houston hip hop and DJ Screw to get us all kind of on the same page a little bit. Um, so the story of hip hop in Houston um, starts with some entities that made it um, the kind of independent culture that it is. Uh, Rap-A-Lot was founded in 1986 by Jay Prince. Uh, the Ghetto Boys released an album in 1991 on Rap-A-Lot with a huge hit, My Mind's Playing Tricks on Me. Uh, it was uh, what they called reality rap, about you know raw music about the streets, um, and it proved that uh, a group from Houston on an independent label um, could really um, hit it big. Uh, another thing that started in 1986 was the South Park Coalition, which was founded by Kay Reno, who's with us this morning. Um, and the idea here was to develop an alliance of rappers, uh, mostly from the South Park neighborhood, who could um, support each other, uh, appear on each other's records, uh, play shows together, and South Park Coalition uh, like rap a lot is still going strong after 25 years. Uh, another key factor in early Houston hip hop was Southwest Wholesale. And this was a sub distributor um, which allowed rappers who were putting out their own independent music um, to work with Southwest Wholesale to get it into stores. Um, so rappers going through Southwest Wholesale could really sell enough uh, music locally or regionally um, to make a living. So the centerpiece of our conference today is going to be DJ Screw. 
He was born Robert Earl Davis Jr. in 1971. He grew up primarily in Smithville, Texas, which is about two hours outside of Houston. He had moved to Houston uh, by the time he was in high school, and he became a DJ. He's primarily known as a mixtape DJ, um, which means he um, worked with other artists' songs and uh, released them on tapes that also showed off his DJ skills. He originated what's known as the chopped and screwed style, and screwed refers to slowing down the music, and chopping is repeating uh, beats, words, or phrases. So the music that he made had this kind of weird underwater sound, um, and all the voices of the rappers on it sounded really, uh, really low and deep. Uh, DJ Screw also put a lot of local rappers and friends on his tapes, and they would freestyle or improvise, and they became known as the Screwed Up Click, and they became very popular as well. Uh, DJ Screw started selling tapes out of his home. Um, they were really popular. People lined up. He would uh, open his gate one night a week. People would line up in their cars, going around the block to come by uh, Screw Tapes. People liked the music um, because it had this unique sound, uh, because DJ Screw was an amazing DJ. Uh, it had, the tapes had a selection of songs that you might not be able to hear on the radio because they were so raw. And people in Houston found them good for driving around, and we do love to drive around in Houston. Um, and also, I hear that people enjoyed the music while smoking weed or sipping cough syrup. I, I, cannot, I cannot verify this. <laughs> um, also, people started to really like particular rappers who were on the tape, and they would um, come to get you know, the new Fat Pat tape or the new Big Mo tape. Um, so uh, it's a wonderful story about the music and the rappers behind it. Um, except that it's clouded by tragedy, as DJ Screw died in 2000, and a number of rappers from his clique, uh, including uh, Fat Pat, Hawk, and Big Mo, um, died as well. So what is the library doing with Houston hip hop? Um, well, this is a picture of the Special Collections Reading Room. And um, what we do there is we document and preserve history uh, with a focus on Houston history. Um, people come into the room, like these folks here, um, to use the material for research. And I felt that if we were documenting Houston culture, we needed to document hip-hop culture. Um, it's something that expresses our city, it expresses the diversity of our student body, um, and the culture of people in the neighborhoods right around campus. Uh, it documents neighborhoods, uh, brings stories particularly of African-American men into the archive, and it's a growing field for scholarly research. So when I started this collection, um, I didn't really know that much about hip hop, but I had been um, in the rock music uh, industry on a small level, so I knew it was really important to reach out to um, people on the inside. Um, oh, and these are some of our students um, using the hip hop collection. Um, but of course, when you want to get some knowledge, um, you go off to see the wizard. Um, so I did meet Kay Reno known as The Wizard, um, and a number of other rappers and talked to them about what should go in the archive. I also involved um, family members of uh, rappers. Um, this is uh, Big D and Lil, I mean, I'm sorry, this is Big Bub and Lil D um, from Screwed Up Records and Tapes. And I started working with the Here Project at Rice and with the local business So South, um, who are um, up at the front table there. Um, so a really exciting thing that happened with this collection is we did receive a gift of the DJ Screw vinyl collection, which is about 1,500 records um, from his personal collection. And as you can see, as well as documenting um, DJ Screw himself and how he worked as a DJ, um, we were able to add music to the library um, from Houston artists, uh, from regional artists, even from some other genres like R&B. Um, and these are some of the records with pretty covers. A lot of them are actually 12-inch um, DJ singles, too. Um, so we began a process of cleaning each record, a uh, very painstaking process. Um, we also will be cataloging the records. Um, so the material in the collection is not um, available uh, for use by the general public yet, but it should be, I hope, in maybe like 18 months. Um, it's it's going to take a while to, to um, get it where it needs to be. But in the meantime, uh, we have an exhibit here in the library, which is the next building over. 
And um, we haven't really built in special time for you to go see it today, but um, you might want to pop by after the conference um, or come back another day. Um, this exhibit is going to be up until September 21st, and the material in it is going to be preserved um, forever um, in the UH Library's special collections. And I would like to invite someone up at this time, Misha Hawkins. Come on up. Um, Misha is the wife of the late rapper Hawk, who was also the brother of Fat Pat, and also someone who's been a great help on the collection. Would you come over here? <laughs> okay. Yeah, grab this mic. Um, so I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. We're going to hear a lot of great stories from rappers and learn a lot. Um, but I also want us, I, I know we wouldn't, but I want um, us to just uh, formally take a moment to remember uh, the people who have left us. And I've asked Misha to come up. Um, because I didn't think it was really appropriate for me to do it. I've asked her to um, read the names um, of some of the people and we're, if we can just take a moment, have a moment of silence to remember them after she reads the names. All right. <clears throat> Let's just have a moment of silence for DJ Screw, Fat Pat, Hawk, Big Mo, Pimp C, Big Mello, Big Steve, AC Chill, Money Clip D, also BG Gator, Mafioso, thank you very much. We love you and we miss all of you all. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. Um, I also have uh, one little announcement and um, that should make everyone happy. Um, Screwed Up Records and Tapes has reopened, for those who didn't get the word. Yay. Um, it is on 3538 West Fuquay. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping, kind of before we um, get on to the main events. Um, lunch is going to be late today. We're going on wrapper time. Um, so it starts, it starts at 1.45. Um, if you can't wait that long, there is food downstairs on the first floor of the University Center. Uh, there are restrooms uh, in, the hall, in the hallway uh, next to where we are. Um, if you walk out and turn left at the So South table, um, you'll see the restrooms there. I'm going to remind anyone who walked in uh, after I said it before to set their phones to silent, please. Um, if anybody wants to uh, tweet and have a discussion uh, about the conference, the hashtag is already A-W-R-E-A-D-Y 2012. Um, and also because this is a little different kind of event and we want to just make sure it goes really smoothly, um, I did consult with a special security consultant for today. And I'd like the, to add, invite our security consultant to come up and, and say something before we begin. You know, to try to bring you into closer to what we're saying, you know, we're just going to show you how it used to go down. Normally, right now, screw would bring the music on. There would be nothing written in the mind. Everything would be just like this. Freestyling at U of H, the boss, some fresh. He's sitting on second row with his leather denim jets. Yes, he's going off and I can't slow down. He's on the front row, khaki pants all brown. Flopsing on the scene, the freestyle king. She dressed in all black, long gold earrings. Still going hard like I do on a Sunday. Read his t-shirt and say God over money. Never slowing down, let me make my point clear. My pocket's kind of big like homeboy's beard. Now that's my dog, man, everybody in the back. Take my picture home so you can Twitter that. It's early in the morning and I'm at the U of H. Like she said, rappers time will wake up late. Still flossing with the boss. You know it goes down. DJ Screw, that's the man with the crime. He really had to die. You know I can't recruit. Now that's fat pet.
in his wood fly suit, boss like Hulk, you just heard his wife, S-U-C, you know I do this for life, now that's Big Mo, my dog long gone, can't forget Pimp C, the trail on the throne, so welcome everybody to the conference today, this is it, say screw, won't you let the record play. Uh, she really wanted me to do this, because this is how it was done back then. You can have a pint, which in the hood is considered served. You can have marijuana sitting on that table. But no one is going to steal any of your drugs if you have a screw tape sitting there. Because from 95, 94, 98, 99, 2005, someone would steal your screw. So do me a favor, watch your screw. I'd like to invite the rappers from that first panel and rappers, DJs, um, to come on up. We've got uh, Steve Fournier, Ricky Royal, Kay Reno, and, and Willie D. En route, Willie D. <laughs> If you guys want to take a seat at like one of the side tables, that would be wonderful. Yeah, either, Ricky, why don't you come over this way? Yeah, we're gonna let Mako sit in the middle. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce our first uh, speaker and moderator. Uh, you wanna have a seat there? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, a native Houstonian, Mako L. Faneel is currently a graduate student in history at Texas Southern University. After earning his MA in August 2012, he will pursue doctoral studies in history. His current research project is entitled, Houston, Can Anything Good Come From There? The Historical Context of Houston Hip Hop Culture, 1979 to 1991. He received his BA in Speech and Communications from Texas A&M University. Faneel has written for the Houston Defender, Trey Magazine, Regal Magazine, and theblacksnob.com. He teaches GED courses through Houston Community College, teaches life skills at a local homeless shelter for youth, and is an active board member of the Bread of Life, Inc. Someone I am proud to know, Mako L. Faneel. I'm an Aggie, so I, I need to feel at home. So if y'all could indulge me for a second. Uh, Texas a and when we start off something, we started like this. Howdy. Howdy. All right, thank y'all very much. Again, my name is Mako Fennell. And I would like to, uh, before I, I get started, uh, thank uh, Julie Grobe uh, for inviting me to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, also thank uh, Julie and the, her staff at the Special Collections Library uh, for uh, taking the time to consider uh, kind of a social and cultural historiography of Houston and in including uh, the DJ Screw Archive. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anthony Penn and uh, his students at the HERE Project uh, for uh, archiving rap -a -lot, uh records um, and also uh, for helping uh, students in the academy contextualize uh, hip hop culture uh, with his course uh, co taught with Bun B. Uh, I would also like to thank my mother uh, for uh, when I was growing up, when we would listen to music or watch TV or go to the movies, she would always make me try to understand context. And she would get on my nerves when she did it because we would listen to a song and she would make sure that I listened to it to understand the broader meaning of it. Or we would watch a movie like Higher Learning and she made sure that I paid attention to Lawrence Fishburne when he said, in order to prosper one must struggle. And so I hated it at that time. But it's helped me uh, to become a better uh, emerging scholar because most of my work uh, as a historian is based on context. Uh, I'm looking for uh, the, the deeper meanings and all of the factors that came together to uh, create uh, something. Okay. So if you can, I want everybody to think back. It's not working. 
<laughs> it's not working. Oh, I think he's fixing it, maybe? Okay, so why, why he's fixing it? Everybody, could, if you could, uh, think back to the, to the first time that you heard a screw mix uh, or uh, a, a screw tape. Okay? For me, it was the summer of uh, 1994. I had just, uh, my mom had just got divorced and we moved from Greens Point to Acres Homes. And I was hanging out with my boy at Pistol and uh, he played this, uh, th this tape I and mean, it sounded like a, a, a Walkman uh, that had lost its uh, battery uh, energy. And so on that, on that first tape that I heard, uh, there was uh, Regulators by Warren G featuring Nate Dogg. It was chopped and screwed. And then uh, there was Pimps by 8-Ball and MJG. And when I heard that, you know, it was kind of funny at first. Uh, but then throughout the summer, I kept listening. And within that year, I became a screwhead. And so I grew up on the north side of Houston, Texas, and uh, on, uh, actually on, on West Guff Bank, uh, and I went to Eisenhower High School. So throughout you know, my time at, at, at Eisenhower, we began to jam screw. And not only did we begin to jam screw, uh, we began to uh, do like uh, rappers did after they heard Rapper's Delight. We began to try to mimic some of those things that we heard on, this, on uh, screw tapes. So we would be in the, uh, in the cafeteria, uh, beating on the benches, uh, trying to flow. Or we would uh, make a makeshift studio at my boy's pistol house and try to flow. Or in classroom, uh, when we were supposed to pay attention, we were beating on the tables um, uh, doing freestyles. Or in the cafeteria, anywhere we could, we would try to do a freestyle. And those freestyles went from uh, something like fun to do to, you know, trying to put out, like, do our own tapes, our homemade uh, tapes. And one of the cats that, was, uh, that, uh, that, that I hung out with was a guy by the name of Roger Brown and Broderick Brown. Most of the world know these guys as 50-50 twin. Uh, those are two of my friends that I grew up with uh, through high school. And those guys went on to be uh, all-stars in their own right. So growing up on the north side, uh, eventually, I started listening to uh, Michael Watts uh, tapes. And I had a cousin that lived on the south side, and she, she was like, you know what, your, your tapes ain't real screw. Uh, you listen to Michael Watts. And uh, at the time, I didn't know the difference. I soon uh, did know the difference. So I graduated from Eisenhower, and I went to Texas A&M University. Now, my whole music collection was filled with gray tapes and Swisher House tapes. So when I get to Texas A&M, we got cats from Dallas, got cats from New York, got cats from Austin. And they're laughing at me because I can't spit Cash rules everything around me. Uh, I can't spit a tribe called Quest. I can't spit any of those things because Houston, we had our own unique style. Within a couple of years, everybody, you know, we would be at parties and JQ was our DJ at that time. We'd be at parties and then they would throw on a Houston mix and then everybody would get crunk on that. And I remember my first time, I went to a conference in Cincinnati and they played Southside. And I was like, yeah, 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 Houston, Houston. And so Houston began to blow up uh, again on a national level. But that's where the problem begins. And I say that's where the problem begins because most of the discourse, most of the texts that study Houston hip hop, uh, they either start in 1986 when James Prince found the Rap A Lot Records. And then they pick back up uh, with the rise of, of, of DJ Screw. They miss a whole lot that happened before then and a whole lot that happened between then. And so my research as a historian is uh, I begin to ask a question. Uh, what's the origin and nature of Houston's hip hop culture? And when we talk about hip hop culture, I'm not specifically talking about music. I'm talking about uh, the, the ways in which um, young people in urban communities begin to chronicle their life experiences and express themselves through this culture that we call hip hop. Right, we got that? So why is this important? Uh, two of my uh, favorite people, Malcolm X and, um, and John Hope Franklin, kind of contextualized this for us. So Malcolm X says that, uh, if I can summarize this, that uh, of all of our studies, history is the best one for us to understand you know, where we are today. Because when you look at history, you look at the origin of a thing. 
And when you can find out the origin of a thing, you find out how we got here, but then also we can comment on the future, which leads us to John Hope Franklin. John, John Hope Franklin uh, postulated that every generation has an opportunity to tell their own history. So uh, most times when we talk about the African-American experience in the United States, uh, we end uh, a lot of times at the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement being a movement that was led by middle class persons. But what happened after the Civil Rights Movement? How did people in urban communities, those experiencing post-industrialization, how did they experience America? How did those people who, who suffered from benign neglect and who, who did not get the benefit of the Civil Rights Movement, how did they experience American life? So this, this, uh, this study is important because hip hop culture connects the civil rights and black uh, power movement with the next generation. So uh, one scholar defines the hip hop generation as those born between 1964 and 1984. And then another scholar uh, says that the generation that's after that is called the post hip hop generation. So this is a generation of people who self identify as hip hoppers. Thus, for the first time in American history, we have a generation of African-American youth who define themselves primarily by a musical and cultural form. This is also important because the conversations that we have about hip hop culture are really often conversations that substitute for the social and behavioral issues uh, about African-Americans, particularly young African-Americans. So an African-American can be like Jay-Z, who we laud, or in the eyes of the consumers of hip hop or in the eyes of the people in America, a African American can be like Trayvon Martin wearing a hoodie who deserves to be murdered. Fourth, musical expression can be understood as a derivative of the culture which produced it. Fifth, identity representation, representation and social chronicling expressed through hip hop occur within particular spaces and places, particularly the local city. So I remember in, uh, around 1991, I was watching *The Living Color and uh, they were doing this bit, and uh, like it was a game show. And one of the characters was from Fifth Ward, Houston, Texas. And I got excited, because from the first time that I can remember, Fifth Ward was mentioned uh, in a national spotlight because of Willie D, because of Bushwick Bill, because of Scarface. Two weeks ago, I was watching a crime show, and the crime show was based in Fifth Ward. And although they got everything wrong about how Fifth Ward was, it was based in Fifth Ward. You have Jay-Z saying, from the fo, fo, like I'm from the H-O-U-S-T-O-N. And so in each one of these, uh, the, these artists' songs, they represent space and place and a, and a significant identity putting Houston or put their neighborhood, neighborhood on the map. Herschel Wood, Texas, fools holding plexus, 19 inch blades on the eaves with Lexus. So I lived on the north side. I didn't know what Herschel was, was. I didn't know what Cloverland. I soon knew when I grew up. But all of these places are put on the map as identity representation, representing space and place. And finally, it has not been done. Houston is left out of the national and international narrative when it comes to hip hop culture. The fourth largest city, one of the earliest cities uh, to, uh, to have its own hip hop culture, but it's left out of the narrative. Okay? So as a historian, there's a couple of questions that I ask. Uh, the first question that I ask is, why is there a negative bias against Houston? Second, what African American music traditions existed in Houston prior to hip hop. I ask this question because I want to establish that Houston is a music city. And in establishing that, music, that Houston is a music city since the early uh, 20th century, uh, then hip hop culture and the sounds that came out of Houston are nothing new. What were the social, spatial, and political contexts that allowed for the development of Houston's hip hop culture? And how did these contexts influence the expressions through the culture? What factors contributed to the development of Houston hip hop culture? And what was the role of Rap -A -Lot Records and the Ghetto Boys play in bringing early national attention to Houston hip hop culture? So in the biblical narrative, 
and I, that side is messed up. In the big, biblical narrative, there's a, uh, there's a story where uh, between uh, Philip and Nathaniel. Philip had just been, uh, been, uh, been, con uh, been converted. He had just seen Jesus. So he goes to Nathaniel and said, hey, this is the cat that we've been talking about, that they talked about in the Old Testament, and he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. Nazareth was considered a place of ill repute, a place where a messianic figure like Jesus wasn't supposed to come from. So I compare that to Houston, a city within a national narrative that's in the South. And when you think about the South, the South is considered other, other when it comes to cultural contributions. You have New York, you have LA, and everything else in between. When people think about Houston, they think that we wear cowboy hats all the time, or they think that we're like uh, J.R. Ewing from the show Dallas. They think that we're country, backwoods, and slow, which may have led Willie D to say, East Coast ain't playing, uh, East Coast ain't playing our songs. I want to know what the hell is going on. Give me my card, radio sucker. I kick your ass and take the... <laughs> Everybody know New York is where it began, so let the ego shit in. Written in the 80s. Telling New York, hey, listen to me. John Nova Lobax uh, claims that Houston rap simmered underground until 2005 when it hit the trust like never before. When Houston was discussed, the coverage was superficial, sophomore, and it lacked context. Lomax commented about this in his article, Mouth of the South, The South Park Turns 20, referring to rapper K. Reno, Lomax says, he's not content to let revisionist history marginalize his critiques, uh, his, his, uh, his clicks feats. MTV Houston Rap, they came to Houston in, uh, in the early 2000s, and they documented Houston hip hop. K. Reno was left out, Rick Royal was left out, Steve Fonier was left out, the Rhinestone Wrangler was left out. Russell Washington was left out. Shortstop Records was left out. Kids Jam was left out. All of these things that created Houston hip hop. As if one day, James Prince woke up and said, I want to do hip hop in Houston. Now, there wouldn't be Houston hip hop without James Prince and, and rap a lot. But that was not the beginning of Houston hip hop culture. So what were the African-American music traditions in Houston? Houston has had a music tradition since the early 1940s, prior to Motown Records. A guy by the name of Don Roby, an African-American Jewish guy who lived in the nickel, founded a company called Duke Peacock Records. Duke Peacock Records was the home to Big Mama Thornton who first popularized the song, You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog, that Elvis took and popularized, and because of his status as a male, as a white male, and having a greater audience and having more promotion, took the light away from Big Mama Thornton. Houston is also home to people like uh, the musicians backed up Johnny Ace and backed up Bobby Blue Band. We have Lightning Hopkins, Clarence Gatemouth Brown. Also, we have Archie Bell and the Drills, the House of Hits, who most people in America who have recorded something have recorded at the House of Hits. Then we have the Cashmere Stage Band with the great late uh, Dr. Conrad Johnson, who for a number of years swept band competitions across the world. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, in, uh, in his book, Why I Love Black Women, uh, talks about his conversation with, uh, with Ruth Simmons, the president of Brown University. And he laughs about Houston's music traditions, uh, saying, uh, talking about Archie Bell and the drills, uh, in, in, in some ways saying that Houston had nothing good to offer. But Houston has always had music traditions. Okay? So we all know that hip hop started in the Bronx, New York. Uh, we know who the pioneers are, DJ Cool Herc, African Bambada, and Grandmaster Flash. We know that story. But how did hip hop get to Houston? Okay. And so in my old interviews and the things that I've read, uh, a rapper's delight changed the game 
for hip hop forever. If you're, if you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's concept of tipping points, Rapper's Delight was the tipping point for hip hop. So no, Rapper's Delight was not the first, uh, the first hip hop recording or hip hop album, but it was the one that changed the game. People across the world saw the Sugar Hill Gang, who had been put together by Sylvia Robinson to commodify a local street phenomenon and turn it into something profitable. So Rapper's Delight was something that everybody saw. And people across the world were like, hey, I want to do that. This is really cool. They inter in interpolated Chick's Good Times, took the break beat, which was, which was something that was popular in hip hop, and made their song. So now we enter the Houston city limit. So, but what, was, what were the political context of Houston uh, during the time when hip hop was started? Robert Bullard, uh, now the new dean of public affairs at Texas Southern University, wrote a book called Invisible Houston, uh, Blacks in Houston during Boom and Bust. So during the 1970s, as America was experiencing post-industrialization, and Houston was also, Houston emerged as the premier sunbelt city in the mid-70s, becoming the mecca of thousands of individuals seeking new opportunities. More than 5,000 persons each month migrated to Boomtown, USA during the city's heyday in the mid-70s. The relatively low cost of living, large number of new jobs created, the phenomenal housing users combined with potential for earning above average income all contributed to Houston's golden book of the Sun Belt. So Houston was booming. We were spreading out. People started moving out of the wards and started moving to the suburbs. But African Americans in Houston at the same time, they were not booming. They were in the, those neighborhoods were imploding. Fifth Ward became the bloody nickel at the same time. Factories in Fifth Ward began to close down, experiencing the downside of post-industrialization in the South. So yes, Houston was booming, but those inner city neighborhoods were imploding. All right, so uh, Bun B has this song, he called uh, uh, Country Cousins with Talib Kweli and, uh, and uh, Bun B and, uh, and uh, Talib Kweli and, and Pimp C, where, in, uh, where in this verse he talks about the experience of him uh, getting involved in hip hop culture. And that story on that song is kind of the story of the people that we have here. So there are a couple of things that played a role, and then we're going to move to our panel in Houston's hip hop development. First, the Swatch Watch uh, Fresh Fest Tour uh, came to Houston, came across the city, and people uh, for the first time uh, saw large concerts. Uh, with hip-hop artists that featured Run DMC, Curtis Blow, Houdini, The Fat Boys, and Nucleus. Uh, we had Kids Jam, uh, so before 97.9 The Box, before 102, before K-Love played uh, hip-hop, Lester Sir Pace on Kids Jam broke new music uh, that came uh, from all over the country, and then also broke uh, artists in Houston uh, that uh, wanted to perform. And this happened every Saturday from 10 to 2 on KTSU. Next we had a song by the name of uh, McGregor Park from the L.A. rapper. And this, uh, this song, uh, ironically, talked about Houston's car culture, talked about hanging out at the park on the south side of Houston, Texas, where everybody hung out. Next we had uh, K. Reno, I mean, uh, Keith Rogers' uh, jukebox says that hip-hop in Houston really caught on with the battle rapping at the Rhinestone Wrangler. So, at the, uh, and Steve Funyale talk about that. Other clubs that we had were Flashes, Gucci, The Rock, Bone Shakers, Palladium, Buffalo Shoulders, The Underground, Club Oasis, and Spuds. Then we had Houston DJs like R.P. Cola, uh, Ricky Cricket, Walter D, uh, Lonnie Mack, Lester Sir Pace. Uh, these guys were responsible for breaking music and playing it in the clubs. Then we had Sound Waves. We have uh, Carlos, uh, Carlos uh, DJ Styles. Uh, was the uh, work at Soundwaves and had a connection to New York and he got a lot of records in where DJs came in and bought these records and then Houston, uh, Houston uh, hip hop lovers. So at one time, as Steve Funye will tell you, Houston was one of the largest markets for rap music in the nation, which caused Def Jam, Leo Cohen, and caused Russell Simmons to come down to Houston to figure out what was going on. And then lastly, we have uh, songs by Kay Reno, uh, in his group, uh, Real Chill, rocking it. 
But then we also have this song by three guys who are often not talked about. Oscar C uh, Ceres, who goes by Raheem, Delton Polk, who goes by K9 or Sir Rap a lot, and Keith Rogers, who goes by Sire Jukebox. These are the uh, three guys who are the, the uh, who started out uh, with the Ghetto Boys, and I don't have time to go to go through the whole story. But this was the original group. They put out a song in 1986 called Car Freaks that took the city by storm, and it, it talked about. Uh, in 2012, it would be called a bopper. Uh, but a car freak, a girl who loved, who loved, uh, who wanted to be in this guy's car so much and wanted to be uh, uh, with the baddest dude that she would do anything to get in the car. A bopper. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so today on my panel, uh, I have uh, some great people that I've that I've had an opportunity to interview uh, that are going to talk to you about Houston's hip hop uh, culture. Uh, the first guy, guy that we have is a guy by the name of Rick Royal, uh, who was a member uh, of a group called the Royal Flush, one of the first groups uh, to be signed to rap a lot in the 1980s. The second cat that I have, I got an opportunity to interview, and uh, when I was in fifth grade, uh, he had, a, he had a, 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 a rhyme on Minds Playing Tricks that helped me boast. He said, I make big money, I drive big cars, everybody knows me. It's like I'm a movie star, but late at night, I won't go on. And then the next, uh, next cat that we have uh, is, is an amazing guy. Uh, his name is Steve Funye. If, uh, if you grew up in the 80s and you went to a club and you listened to hip hop, you encountered Steve Funye. And then the next cat that we have uh, is one of the, uh, uh, the best uh, rappers to come out of Houston, to come out of the nation, ever. A great lyricist, a great heart, a conscious brother. Uh, I won't say his, uh, I, I, I did find out your, your, your government name, you didn't want to give it to me. Uh, but uh, uh, he goes by K Reno. All right, if you could. All right. So I'm a, uh, I have some, some panel questions and then I have some individual questions, okay? So I'm about, what's that? Oh, oh, okay, I'm, I'm good. So, so the, uh, the first question that I have is, uh, when do you remember, and anyone can answer this or everybody can answer that, and we, we're gonna keep this short. <laughs> when do you remember first being exposed to this thing called hip hop? And I'll start with, uh, with Rick Royal. When you say hip hop, you mean Houston hip hop or hip hop? Hip hop in general, and I want you to really tell, uh, you have a unique story about that. Okay. Me being born on the East Coast, I was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I heard it before it was on records. Like, I heard it when it was, when it was just tapes. So it's similar to the, to the DJ Screw era. All hip hop used to be on tapes, it was all abstract. You never hear a whole song, you hear a whole lot of, Instrumental and DJs really just chanting, and there's some a few rounds. So that's, that was my first experience to to hip hop. Period. Then I, I moved to Los Angeles, California, where I was raised at, and uh, and, and out there it was more like like technical beat oriented, like like Egyptian Love. I don't know if y'all familiar with any, anybody like Egyptian Love or the Reckless Crew and and L.A. Dream Team. That's that's Dr. Dre's original era right there, and uh. A lot, lot of like, 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 lot of uh, techno, techno sounds and, 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 and what they call the boogaloo. When you see all that little, the, the, the moves all like that. See, popping and boogaloo is different things, but they call it the music boogaloo. So that was my second experience. But then when I got to Houston, it was a totally, totally different thing. I heard all that together for the first time, which you didn't hear it on the East Coast. You didn't hear the West Coast, and on the West Coast you didn't hear too much of what was going on down south. But when I got down south in Houston, I moved to Texas from L.A., that's when I heard the Houston, the Houston scene, which was everything. Everything that was being done in hip-hop, I heard it right here for the first time, ever. All right. Willie? My first uh, one, two, one, two. Break one down, one down. My first experience with hip-hop came with Rapper's Delight. <laughs> The hip hop, hip 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 hop, you don't stop the rock to the bang bang begin. That's 
He helped jump the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie. Okay, so that was my first experience. I was playing football for the Hester House. Uh, it's, it's a uh, community uh, organization in Fifth Ward, and I was in the seventh grade, and we had a big game at at uh, the Astrodome. We was playing in the championship game, and I was playing on turf for the first time, and my young, strong legs were excited, you know, to get out there on the field and. And so all the way from home, like from Fifth Ward all the way to the, to, to, to the time that we got to the Astrodome, we just kind of like played it back. We just kept playing that song back in the whole bus, as you can imagine, like 40 kids and even coaches just singing this song, uh, Rapper's Delight. That, that was my first experience with hip hop. And that's when I first got excited about it. But I didn't want to rap. I was just enjoying the music like I was enjoying everything else, all the other genres of music. Steve? Uh, 1979. That's when I heard Jimmy Spicer and Super Rhymes and Grandmaster Flash. And I got that from a record executive that brought the music to me. Said, this is rap. That's the first time I heard it. And the first day I heard it, I said, that's what I'm going to do. And I did it for 25 years after that, nonstop. Don't know what. God sent a message to me, said, this is what you're going to do. So there's a lot more to it than that, but that's when I first heard rap. And got it, started playing it in clubs and on and on. Well, the first time for me <clears throat> as well was uh, Rapper's Delight. I might have been about nine years old and everybody was tripping with me because I was the only one in the neighborhood who knew all the words by heart. I could sing Rapper's Delight like I wrote it. And um, I think later on, I don't remember what year what it, another song came out. I don't even remember who sang that song. I came out called Your Mama. And I don't know if y'all remember that. It's like, Your Mama. And that like just got me on the just the, the rank rapping side of it, man. So, I mean, those were my early recollections just with Rapper's Delight and Curtis Blow and, and songs of that nature. So, talking about late 70s. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so uh, what encouraged you guys to want to get involved in this hip hop culture, um, you know, as, as rappers and for Steve, for you as a promoter, a DJ, and all of that. And I guess everyone can an answer this question because these are some unique stories. And we'll, we'll start right here with Rick Roy. All right. Man, I, I love to tell this story right here. Personally, mine started on accident. I used to be a drummer for my brother's rap group. And uh, one day I said, I just want to rap. So. I want to try it out. I didn't know what to do, though. I didn't, I didn't know how to go about it. So I remember I got some words in my mind. I was like, Straw, Terry Bradshaw, Law, Raw. So when I went to bust a rap for the group, I said, OK, I, I got a rap. Y'all check it out. I went and started saying my little rap. And I got stuck on Straw. For some reason, I couldn't get past it like a straw. It Terry Bradshaw, just like a straw. Like a crazy straw, like a like a Terry Bradshaw, like a rock. Like, they like get your ass out of here. <laughs> we don't want to, we don't want to hear you rap no more. And you know what? My brother was the was one of my brothers was the leader of the group, and he stutter. Now, yeah, yeah, y'all heard me right. He stutters, and he the leader of the rap group. And he told me, that's why we tell you to play the drums. So, <laughs> sorry, right, here we go. So I got back. I got back on the drum, but I thought about how they, how, how, how they didn't even encourage me. They tell me they didn't give me no kind of insight. Like this, is what you should do, because I didn't understand how they had all these rhymes. So I, so the next day I went and wrote a rap. I, I carefully wrote a rap to get and really talking about them. Everybody in the group, my cousin, my brother, and uh, I think that's where gangster rap began. Because I promise you, I cussed them out so bad, and I ain't gonna tell y'all. I ain't gonna tell y'all the lyrics I said. But it got real, it got real deep up in there. <laughs> and, I, and at the end of it, I said, I said you know what? Uh, F y'all and take these drums and these sticks, I quit. And I slammed the sticks down, 
But that's the day that I said, you know what, I'm going to keep going. And from that, that moment, what happened was that my, that was my style. I created my own style just from being mad at them. And that's how all, I wrote all my raps like that from then on. That's, that's my uh, uh, introduction to rap. And, and, uh, and Rick, you're from, the, you're from the north side, right? Yeah. All right. Yo. Appreciate it. Hey, man, y'all ain't got no sound, man. No sound. Technician. Y'all, can y'all One, two. Hey, we're going to try to get another mic, man. This ain't right. See if this was like a real performance. Yeah. I would yeah. probably cuss the sound man. I get the whole crowd. <laughs> Say sound man. <laughs> I'm an artist and I'm serious about my music. Um, my first introduction was uh, um, I think what 19 like 80, 84, 85, something like that. Um, we used to sing out. We used to be out in the neighborhood. Uh, singing and stuff, all like doo-wop, like Motown type songs. We, we, when we weren't uh, fighting, you know, we would find time to sing. And <laughs> we were hanging out one day listening to Run DMC, and one of my buddies, Steve, Steve Mayweather, was like, oh man, me and, Will, man, me and Willie can do that. And uh, so I'm just listening to him. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not even thinking about hip hop and I'm, in terms of like being an artist. Uh, so, you know, I was at the time I was boxing. So I thought that was going to be my ticket. So um, everybody was like, yeah, right. So they challenged us to go, you know, to try to, you know, come up with something. So we, each one of us went into our, house, our houses and we came out in an hour. And Steve said his rap and everybody started laughing. And then I said my rap and everybody started like raising their eyebrows going like, man, you know, that's all right. So that kind of encouraged me to write more. And, you know, people started knocking on my door. But, you know, if you know anything about especially early hip hop, people like to battle, you know. They come knock on my door like, hey, man, so-and-so, so-and-so want to battle you, you know. And I'm like, all right, I come out come out the house like it's a real, like a fight, you know, I get prepared, put my shoes up, lace up, go, you know, go, go, go lace up and everything, do my stretches and everything, I come out the house like, okay, what's up? And we would just battle, and for the first, like, maybe six months, I rapped the same rap for, like, I had, like, eight bars, and I rap my little eight bars, you know, and I go real, real hard for that eight bars, and then when I get to the end, I'd be like, Man, I ain't, I ain't gonna even finish on you, fool. <laughs> you ain't worth my time. And I'll turn and walk off, you know. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> after a while, you know, I said, let me switch it up before, <laughs> before they catch on. So I started, you know, I would write a little, I started writing a little bit more, and that turned into a verse, then eventually turned into a rap. And, you know, from there, I just started competing and, and, and getting better and better. And, and around that time, I, I was like, yeah, uh, this is what I want to do. Uh, I guess, like I said in the first part, something came upon me, and I hate to say it like this, but maybe it was God, intervention, if people believe in that. But he said, this is what you're going to do. And the more I did it, the more passionate I got about it. And that's what I can say, not jumping too far ahead, but that's what a lot of the young people out there, they are missing the passion that these three gentlemen had. It was a passion with me. It was, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to, if I don't eat, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be playing rap music. I found a club that would let me play rap music. And then I seen the younger guys come up, like K. Reno and Willie and Rick and all the guys come to the club. And they were, had so much passion that I did. And they really, these guys here really kept me going year after year to see the more I went to New York or LA and talked to Russell or whoever and brought it back, they would just feed off it and they'd get stronger and stronger and stronger at what they were doing. 
So there was a lot of stuff that I learned and brought back or did myself here, and I just couldn't stop. I mean, I just couldn't stop doing it. And so that, if you're saying that was my introduction to bring the city into what I believed in, and it just took a lot of passion to do it. And believe me, it was a lot, a lot of struggle to have rap music being played back then. You would not believe what I had to go through to get music played. It was a big deal. For a guy to say, man, I got a record and it was hot all over the country, but it wasn't me played in Houston, was a problem for me. And no, I was just one little old guy. Obviously, one little old white guy trying to make it happen and the radio stations I said look you want your record played I'll tell you what we're gonna do seriously take note because this is what happened we would have to go to the radio station buy a commercial you guys can remember this buy a commercial and say Rick Willie DK Reno is gonna be at club 808 or whatever and for 40 seconds play the goddamn record so they could hear the record on the radio so they made us pay to do that. I'm saying that to say that's the kind of passion it took year after year, and I didn't want to stop. Once I got in it, I wasn't stopping. Lost a wife over it, I wasn't stopping. But now, in case this gets played back, I have a beautiful wife <laughs> that I've had for 20 years, <laughs> two beautiful children, but it was a passion. So I, you know, that's, that's all I can say about it. I, I can go on and on, but we ain't got a lot of time, so turn it over to Kay Reed. It was um, the song, The Message. It's like a jungle sometime. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. And um, Melly Mel was the rapper on that song, Grandmaster Flash, The Furious Fire. And the first rap I wrote, I was like 13 years old. Well, I can't say the first rap. I, the first rap I stole, I was 13 because my whole rap was based around trying to rap like and sound like Melly Mel on the message. And um, of course, Run DMC was a big influence and, and just coming up in the neighborhood. I was raised in the neighborhood in South Park called The Dead End. And um, it was so many cats that was ahead of me as far as already rapping, already battling, doing what they did. And I was new to it. So I accidentally battled a guy in middle school for the first time, just with a rhyme I wrote, and they brought me out in the square and said this guy was doing his thing and he was fly and he was pretty boy and kidding everybody and I stepped out there and, and just put on some shades because I was scared and said my rap and got the response and the, the audience hollering and screaming and I was like, okay, I, you know, I guess I won. But, uh, you know, thank God it only went one round, you know, because like Will, I wouldn't have been able to go, you know, but that one. And ever since then, you know, that bug bites you. When that bug bites you, you're gone from now. So some 20-some years later, you know, you know, we still, we still hooked on that dope. And so that was my first introduction to it, just from just hearing Melly Mel and Rapper's Delight and the early pioneers and and then trying to do our own thing in our neighborhood and make a way for ourselves. Thank you, thank you. So you guys uh, talk uh, a lot about uh, battle rapping. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you could, and, and all of you are from different sides of town. We have uh, uh, South Side uh, represented. We got the North Side, NAWF. We got two North Siders here, Forrest Brook and Aldine. And then we got uh, Sterling. Uh, over there. Talk to me a little bit about how this, this battle rapping um, went from a, uh, a good little hood thing, <laughs> something that y'all were uh, just hanging out doing, to, um, to these competitions that would happen <laughs> at these clubs. And so all, I guess all four of you guys can, uh, can speak to that. Hey, first of all, you got to understand something. If you wanted to be a rapper in Houston, you wanted to be known, you had to battle. Right. It was the hard, we came up the, what we call the hard way. You, when, we were gonna, you, if you made a record, that was kind of like your damn business. There ain't nobody, ain't nobody playing your record. If you want to be known in Houston, Texas as for a rapper, you got to come to the Rhinestone Wrangler, or we can go before that flashes. Right. And, and Steve Fournier was like our Russell Simmons. 
You understand what I'm saying? Like, he's really the godfather. Between him and Wicked Cricket, they're the godfathers of, of Houston hip-hop because they were the first one to put it on the main, on the main like, in the, on the scene somewhere so everybody can see it. We came to their events to rap. They would, they would host these events, and they DJ in there or whatever. And, uh, and, and my group, Royal Flush, I mean, we, we used to have conversations about this all the time. We, we, we so-called, what they say, broke the rules. Because the battle raps would be like, to get in the preliminaries, you just do a regular song. And then they get in the battle. You know, at this time, we, when we, when we uh, started battling, like everybody rapped about what rap rapped about. You know what I'm saying? MC and then <laughs> Steve Funny ain't laughing because we talk about this all the time. We, everybody rapped about the, the, the turntables, they, they rhymes and all that. And, and you got to remember, like I told you in the beginning, where my, my attitude came from, I started off just really just disrespecting everybody I, I would <laughs> lay eyes on. So that's what, that's what we would do. We, when we get to the battle, the final part, everybody would look at us crazy like, uh, what the hell are they doing? We could be talking about your ass. Like, we ranking on everything you got on. We talking about your mama. We talking about beating you up when the, when the whole thing is over with, whether we lose or win. You know what I'm saying? That was kind of our style. You feel me? Then we got known for, uh, what, what, uh, then we got a, 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 a five peers. We got a, a, a black mark on our name, Royal Flush, because everybody started calling us cat rappers. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because, Rap. Hold on. They, they can't really rap about rap, <laughs> but they cap your ass. They cap your ass under the table. Though. You dig what I'm saying? So that caught on like fire. And I, I'd like to say that if y'all ever seen the movie Purple Rain, that was like us. Like really, not not Eight Mile, cause Eight Mile got they style from us. And y'all can document what I just said realistically. Also, gangster rap. All that started from what we did on them stages. Yeah. The battle rapping that we did on them stages is what, what made Lil J say, I'm going to start a record company. Yeah. Because putting out Car Freak was one thing. He just did that for them so that they can stay in school. Right. But to make a real record company, that came from, from, the, from the battle raps and the rhinestone wrangler where we would viciously go at each other. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. like, we would, we would, we would, like, matter of fact, it turned into, this is what we're going to do. For, like, we, all week long, we creating our rap. That we're gonna say on stage to each other. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's what Gangsta Rap was created at because a lot of them guys that you know on the West Coast, they managers was down here in Houston, Texas, watching us battle on stage at the Rhinestone Wrangler yeah. and taking that back to, to LA and, and letting them, man, them dudes in, in, in Houston, they yeah. going hard. You know Tough. what I mean? Like, realistically, that's, 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 that's how important the, uh, the battle rap was. It, like I said, it went from us competing. To really, it just became the way you're gonna get known in Houston. That, point blank, period. That's it. That, that's it. I'm gonna touch on something, Willie, before you get, let go, then you get to skip by me. What he, what he, just, what he just said is absolutely needs to be documented. Because from the opening statements, what's not documented, I can tell you for true that artists would come down to play my club, the Rhinestone Wrangler. They did not know nothing about gangster rap. They didn't know nothing about rough rapping. All of a sudden, after they seen all these young men on stage ranking every Sunday night, mysteriously, six months later, NWA's album comes out. The World Class Wrecking Crew. Answer me how that happened. That, that's how it happened. So, document it, that's it. I ain't got nothing to lose. I don't give a fuck. So, you know, that's the truth. That, you know, I'm up here to speak the truth today. And I'm gonna get this off my chest before I have to pass it on and time runs out. A lot of people over the last 10 or 12 years asked me to come speak about how Houston rap got started, what, how it really got started. I wouldn't do it. So that young man right there sat down in my business and told me what it was, this was all about. And the truth of it is about is Houston has been left out of a lot of the rap history. Our money, our money put those rappers where they are. Our money has got Russell Simmons and Leo Cohen very wealthy. It's our money here that bought all the music. It was a fact when um, I had the north side rhinestone wrangler, and Lior and Russell came down, put me in their hotel room and said, what the hell are y'all putting in your music? 
What are you doing down here? All these people buying music. Went back up to New York, slowed their shit down, and then what? Here come Mama Wanna Knock You Out. LL Cool J, once again, history in the making. So Houston has a major, has always had a major influence, never got the credit for it. And like I said, basically you could say, where you been the last 10 years? I've been out of the business. I started my own business. But I'm, I'm not really in the music business anymore. I do consulting now and then, that's about it. But they can come right here to my face, they can bring the lawyers to the table, I'm still gonna say the same thing. The fact is the fact. Houston needs to get its credit where it's due. Not so much me, I, I don't care. I mean, it's, it's been there, it's been not. And uh, Nelson George, I'm gonna bring up some heavy names. Nelson George, other people around the country come down and do interviews with me, get all the shit they can out of my brain and go back to New York, write their article, and my name ain't mentioned nowhere. Yeah. Real that's talk. the that's the bitter part. That's the bitter Real part. Talk. And I'm and I'm saying, what's going on? What's going on? Now, the way I feel in New York and LA, they're not looking for rappers no more. They're looking for marketable people. A young man. Let him go make his two or three million. Let him do his rap thing. Go ahead. But then they exploit him and make movies. They make commercials. They make a billion dollars and let them go, go do your little rap thing. Make you two or three million. So now it's even harder for the young men out there when we were doing the ranking contest to make long story short. They don't do that no more. They don't do that. And they need to do that. There needs to be a club in Houston that does that. We need to develop talent. They need to have people go through the whole process again and find out what it's really about because these guys used to, people would, we'd have a rap contest and they would come and see the rappers do their rap. That's not what they were waiting for. They were waiting for these guys to rank. That's what they were waiting yeah. on. Yeah. They would wait all night. They would miss work the next day to see these guys do this. And so, since I was the only place they could do it, I wanted to make sure it happened week after week, a week as long as I could make it happen for them. And I'm sorry if I took too much time, but I just had to get that off my chest because it seemed relevant at the time. So, sorry, Willie. So, yeah. Appreciate you. Let me, t let me tell you something, brother. You deserve all the time you want. You feel, me? You, still, you feel what I'm saying? Yeah, I hear you. That's why I pleaded with, I, I was at a basketball game, his son's basket. I, I hadn't seen this man in about 20 years. And I ran into him at a AA basketball. St. Peter's. Saint, at St. Peter's, uh, his son was playing basketball. And by the way, his son is a phenomenal basketball player. The boy bad. <laughs> so I, I pleaded with this man. I basically begged this man to come to this conference because I know history have, been, have not been properly documented, Houston's history particularly. So this man, him, uh, uh, R.P. Cola, Walter D., uh, Wiki Cricket, Ricky Raw, Romeo Poet, Rome. these guys very, very, very seldom uh, ever mentioned in the dialogue when we're talking about music history. And if it's if not for them, it ain't no us for real. It ain't no history, because history, it got to start somewhere. And I'm telling you, this is where it started. And that's why I was like, man, you, you got to come, because silence is con consent. You see what I'm saying? So if they run out there and go just half-ass report the history, it, don't nobody know what it is. If you turn the TV on and you watch somebody talking about, well, this is Houston's history. This is how it started. And you're looking at it, you're like, well, shit, I guess that's how I started. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but if but if you yeah. you 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 if you do, if the if the if if it's documented properly, if you I always say if you're gonna do something, anybody do something. I and I don't want to be sound like the, the mad rapper, you know, <laughs> but if you're gonna talk about Houston history, 
Don't try to crank it up in the 2000s. Don't try to just get with the rappers because they hot. Whoever hot, who on the radio right now. Your, your uh, conference, your seminar, your, your documentary has no credibility if these kind of cats ain't mentioned. Thank you. You have no credibility whatsoever. So anytime y'all watching, if ever y'all watch any kind of history about Houston hip hop, and these dudes, we talking about history, I ain't just talking about somebody, oh, he's uh, interviewing Slim Thug and they didn't mention him, Ricky Raw. I mean, not that. I'm talking about somebody say, well, we're documenting history. I mean, hip, Houston yeah. hip hop. If they're not mentioned, it has zero credibility. And y'all could pass the word on. Hey, I am, I am not, let me say something. I ain't trying to tit for tat, but I want to be the first one to say that. I, I never understood why when they say the king of the, the, king of the South, how come they never ever just like plainly been Willie D? And I'm, and I'm, and I'm quite sure K. Reno I'm the will, 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 will really uh, attest to me, like he will agree with me on this, because Willie D is the first person that we ever heard rap South. Let's keep it real. He the one that boldly said, you know, I ain't finna do it like they doing it in New York no more. I ain't finna do it like nothing. No, no. I'm finna rap how I talk. And, that's, and if it wasn't no Willie D, it ain't no Pimp C. Pimp C would tell you that. Right now, he will come back and tell you that right now. Hey, Rick, let me that's that real talk. I mean, I just want—I want to say that because, and not just because he, he, he right here. This is like a big brother to me, and, you know what I'm saying? But realistically, we talking about the king of the south. That needs to be understood. I mean, we talking about the south. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of us, really, that was that came out at first wasn't even really from the south. You know what I'm saying? Rap like whole 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 uh, uh, roster was full of East Coast rappers. And I was one of them, but I'm the one that came from the West Coast. Willie D, the first one. Even Scarface is from Camden, New Jersey. Y'all probably didn't know that. You understand what I'm saying? And then, then giving it a more serious approach, K. Reno should be known for that too. Because K. Reno's voice, flow, and direction, I mean, he was like, K. Reno was always one of the people that was like, I ain't finna fuck with him. <laughs> hey, Rick. Rick, you knew that, you know what I'm saying? So it seemed like they kind of like left him out on purpose. You don't hear his name in the beginning because they didn't want to have to deal with that boy. You understand what I'm saying? We all deserve that, 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 that uh, what I want to call that archive niche. We, we, we did something that made everybody in Houston want to rap, period. Hey, Rick, let me pull it back in right quick. Right, I'm gonna come right back to you, Kevin. Hey, 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 let me jump before we go too far on anything else. Let me just make a comment about the battle part. <laughs> Say, man, when it, the battle rap, it defined everything about Houston hip hop. When my first battle rap was at Flash's nightclub, mm -hmm. and I went unprepared. <laughs> Rick Raw, Romeo Poet, Classy, Sergio, Classy. Classy. These dudes, when I say they were shine, they had, they were professional. They had their their uh, wardrobe straight. They had a beatboxer, a DJ, two battle rappers, and I walk in the club unprepared. I ain't even got no music. I'm just finna get up on stage and show y'all I can rap. Man, I got booed off the stage. I cussed the crowd. <laughs> I was like. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be back. Yeah. See, cause I was, I was writing raps in between knocking on doors selling the Houston Chronicles subscriptions. Yeah. So, so, you know, I mean, I was serious about doing it, but I just didn't know. How, how old were you? I, I, how, how old were you doing? I was like, uh, well, by that time I was like uh, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. You were, <laughs> so, I remember, I, I, I so, can picture back oh, seeing you no, how no, young. No, 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 <laughs> but not the roster, not the flash. We were 15, 16, sneaking I, in the club. Now, now y'all were, I, I came in. See, they had more experience than I did. Yeah. They were a click, for, they was polished. Yeah. I mean, I, these dudes were bad. I went up to that club and got booed off stage. I came back the following week. I didn't, I didn't uh, get, uh, you know, I didn't win, but I, get, I didn't get booed either. Yeah, yeah. So I just kept on going, and that's something that, that, that y'all should pick up from also is that, you know, if you feel like you got something, you got a certain gift, oh, yeah. go for it, man. Don't let nobody stop you. I'm the type of person, I'm vengeful on all levels. 
<laughs> so I was like, they not finna get me. So I kept going back out of pride, you know. I felt like I was prideful. I was like, I, I got to beat them. You know, it yeah. took me about seven, eight weeks to finally win one, yeah. but I got them, yeah. you know. And, and I just wanted to, wanted to share that with y'all, man, because that right there, oh, and that, that kind of defined my state of mind when we got booed in New York for the first time. <laughs> when Ghetto Boys went to New York at Palladium, downtown Manhattan, mm -hmm. and we got, people was booing us. They was, they was, they was taking breaks booing us. <laughs> this is how bad it was. Like, they was booing us in shifts. You know, like, the play, it was like 2,000 people in this place. It was jam packed, and it's like 200 reporters up in the front and we got this song called Mind of a Lunatic out and everybody's talking about this group out of the South, Ghetto Boys. And they, I mean, the, the, it's media hysterica. And we on the stage, I'm walking back and forth on the stage. I mean, when we walk, first of all, when we walk in from backstage, I've never been greeted by a, a, a bodyguard that way. The bodyguard by this tall, and he looking at us like, I'm talking about the security. I mean, they looking at us like, we don't want you here, you know? So we go in anyway, it's like five of us. It's me, Bushwick, Scarface, <laughs> our manager, Tony Randall, and Steve, you know, uh, you know, I do everything guy, you know? So we go in, we hit the stage, they come out, get over, boo, 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 boo. So <laughs> I'm going side to side on the stage, and uh, face say, <laughs> face tell me, say, say we, I mean, you ready to go, man? I say, nah, man. I, I say, man, I ain't, I ain't come all the way down here to do, be leaving no stage, man, in five yeah. minutes. Yeah. I'm doing the whole show. <laughs> so, so we, <laughs> when they realize that we're not going to leave the stage, they, we, I see, the, I look out into the audience, <laughs> they sitting over there doing like this here, they doing like this here. And then they trying, they looking at each other like, who gonna start off the next boot? You know? And the reason why they booing us, cause we using, we using words like bitches and hoes. Yeah. And, yeah. and at the time, yeah. nobody yeah. on the East Coast would, would, would <laughs> no. use those type of words. Yeah, so no. we using those words and they mad. Yeah. So it's two girls in the front of the audience, right in the front, and I found out later they happened to be from Houston. But it, it's two girls right in the front and they rapping every single song. They jamming out, like they don't care about nothing in the back. They just jamming out, rocking out. And we get to the end, we get to the end of the, uh, <laughs> we get to the end of the show. And uh, at this time, Heavy D's uh, body, uh, Heavy D's dancer had, uh, like about a few weeks before that, had uh, lost his life. He, he fell off a bridge Trouble and yeah, Trevor T. Roy, he lost his life, uh, you know, by an accident. And so I said, well, yeah, I know y'all don't give a damn about us, but I know somebody y'all do give a damn about. And I said, Trouble T. Roy. So on the count of one, two, three, I need everybody in here to say peace to Trouble T. Roy. I said, one, two, three, they said, peace to Trouble T. Roy. I said, yeah, motherfuckers, we'll be back. <laughs> Stay on the mic. <laughs> hey, one year later, one year later. Hey, we sold out Madison Square Garden. You feel what I'm saying? Real talk. Real talk. Real talk. Real talk. Real talk. Real talk. Hey, let me just uh, speak on the battle aspect real quick, man. I mean, yeah. what they was doing um, on the north side at the rhinestone, we was doing the same thing on the south side. That dynamic is, is interesting because um, I had people like Gangsta Milk, Klondike Cat, uh, AC Chill, all these cats who went to Jones High School. I went to Sterling High School, so it was a natural just rivalry. Back in those days, and, and Rick spoke on it, you could be walking through the mall, man. It could be three, four hundred people in the mall, but you knew who the rappers was. The 
somehow. You're in a club. You know who the rappers is. You just automatically knew, man. And, and for some reason, I don't even really know each other, but we got a battle. But we just, just got to be that way. We got to prove who the best. So we was doing our thing, just squaring off on the south side. We didn't make many trips to the north side because my homie Murder One, he used to go to the rhinestone all the time. He said, man, they battle out there, but... With a D in there, they be beating people up after the battle and stuff. So we didn't make too many trips out there, but um, it, it was just interesting because I mean that's what sharpened us as rappers. That that battle mode sharpened us and put that competitive spirit in us, man. And even to this day, our raps are uh, we got that aggressive nature to, to our styles. And people look at it like, man, these dudes is on on some other stuff. But I mean that's just how we came up, man. If you came up fighting every day in your neighborhood, man, and that's all you ever did, even when you in a peaceful environment and somebody tapped you the wrong way, you instantly on the defensive because that's just the, the training that you had. So, you know, it made us better as artists and also the, the neglect that we experienced from the East Coast, from the West Coast, from those powers that was dominant at that time, you know, it, it put a chip on our shoulder naturally. So. From Steve's uh, point of view, that was part of his battle. He, we, he was battling industry entities like we ended up having to do at some point when we was ignorant to the game and we would start making our records. We started off in the battle pool, but then we got to the point where we started getting to the industry side of it and we would do what they call shop your record. You would send your, your, your tape to uh, Warner Brothers or, or Def Jam or wherever you sent it to and they throw it in the box and not even listen to it. So I mean, that was another war that we had to fight just to build our name. We started this independent rap game that they just now starting to get on right now. That started down here because we was never allowed to be in the circle. So by us being outcast, being country, being down here in the South, we had to do it on our own and started selling independent records through whether it be rap a lot through Southwest Wholesale and doing our own thing. And, and Steve Fournier and people like Cricket and Kids Jam and Lesser Sir Pace, cats like that, they would play our records. Steve was one of the guys who always DJed at a crunk club. Every club he was at was a hot club, whether it was North Side, South Side. And, but what, what I always appreciated about Steve was that you could bring your record into the club no matter how packed the club is, everybody listening to the hits that they know, and song after song is a hit that they hear on the radio or see on the video show, you bring your record in, he'll play your record right in the middle of what's going on, and you put that brand new record on the air, and everybody walk off the dance floor because they never heard it before. But he used to give you that opportunity, man, and he would play that record. If he liked it, he would play that record until it grew on the people and the people started to like it. DJs don't do that no more. All the DJs that they so Hollywood and they bandwagon DJs and they play with everybody else is already playing. Don't nobody take the chance to say, hey man, you know what, we're gonna try to break this record if we believe in it. So I'm the mad, I'm the mad rapper too, Will. You ain't the only mad rapper on the stage, man. So that's what's up. Yeah. You know what, that I, I can remember. You Steve, bring Steve, up the DJ. Steve, let me pull it back in right quick. All right, good. All right. So uh, we got uh, we talked about the clubs, and when I was talking to Steve uh, in an interview, one thing that was unique about the clubs in Houston, uh, we do everything bigger in Texas. So in Houston, you were able to pack a thousand people in one club, whereas in New York, you can't pack a thousand people at one club. That's a factor. They mentioned Kids Jam and the significance of Kids Jam. So if you wanted your album to get played, or your, your uh, not album, your tape to get played that you made at home, you take it up to Kids Jam. Kids Jam was a college radio station uh, that had a hip hop format, one of the first hip hop formats in the nation uh, where music was broke. If you guys could, take a look at this picture again. I wanna make sure that these three guys are in your memory. And I'm gonna read something and I'm going, to go, I'm going to Willie D. So we had McGregor Park that came out in 1985. 
It went like this, McGregor Park, that's where I want to be. McGregor Park, my car, my freaking me. So McGregor Park comes out, gets played on Kids Jam. Within the next two years, a few other groups will put together uh, singles to make their name uh, known and show their lyrical prowess in Houston. These groups took their skills from the rap battlegrounds, the corner streets, the playgrounds, and the local clubs to wax. Two songs stand out. One is Rockin' It by a group called Real Chill. It's Kay Reno. And another one is called Car Freaks by a group called The Ghetto Boys. Rockin' It will be the first of countless offerings by one of the most underrated and underrecognized rappers in the history of Houston's hip hop, Kay Reno. And also the stage for Houston's first rap clique, the South Park Coalition. Car Freaks would set the stage for the group that would put Houston on the hip hop map. By 1986, hip hop culture had gone uh, national and persons in local communities wanted to participate and wanted to make some money. Now that Houstonians were more immersed in the culture, MCs, groups, producers, investors wanted to make a career uh, out of their interests. The story of Thelton Polk, Oscar Series, and Keith Rogers are shining examples of this desire to make hip hop a career move. Thelton Polk is a native of Houston who grew up in Fifth Ward and Trinity Garden areas. He, like other young people in the early 80s, was influenced by what he saw and heard coming out of New York, so he began rapping too. His story is important for two reasons. He will become an original member of the Ghetto Boys when it was G-H-E-T-T-O, and because his brother is James Smith, AKA James Prince. Oscar Series was an ambitious young rapper from New Jersey, who used to battle rap with K Reno and Jukebox. And he tells a story that the way he, that he got involved, he wanted to go rap this cat by the name of OG Style, who at the time was Prince Easy E, I believe. So he heard, he heard OG Style on, on Kids Jam. And so he caught the bus, skipped school, went to Jack Yates trying to find him, ended up battle rap and got, his, uh, got, got beat in a battle rap, but he ended up meeting Jukebox. So, Keith Rogers shared the ambition for, uh, with his new comrade. Rogers was from Third Ward. He had a group called the Awesome Three and Jukebox, which was Shannon Lincoln, who was Kid Fresh, Boyd Lee Woodbury, Rappin' Lee, and John Williams, Diamond T, from Yates. They formed a group called the Awesome Three and Jukebox. They would skip school to go to other schools and battle. Roger says that he cannot recall that, uh, that there were people as devoted to this thing as we were. They soon began to perform at college shows and other talent events, even opening up for the SOS band at the TSU homecoming. The group was initially managed by a TSU chapter, AKA sorority, who helped them get gigs and brought them along to their community service events. And the audience on that day of the TSU homecoming was a con artist by the name of Brian, whose chicanery would eventually lead Rogers and Series to Jane Smith. Rogers recalled the incidents by saying, this guy Brian came to us with the briefcase and he and, uh, said this and that. His credentials was tight, and at least they looked tight to a 14-year-old kid. And it looked like he had his act together. And my thing was, run DMC, I'm trying to get on TV, I want to be like LL Cool J. But what he was really wanted was to use us to get to the money. Jane Smith had the money. So he took us out to meet Prince, Smith at the time, and for what I understand, Prince gave him a few thousand dollars and we never saw him again. This hoax did not deter Rogers. He says that I was hungry, that I, so I never stopped going to Fifth Ward. The other members of the group soon pursued other interests, but Rogers was determined to manifest his desire to be a rapper. He would walk to Fifth Ward to convince Jane Smith to make him an album. One day he brought his new buddy, C, uh, Oscar, who became Raheem, with him, and this meeting changed both of their lives forever. Oscar says, Box, who is Jukebox, called me and let me know that some individuals were interested in doing some music. So he said, meet me uh, on Delilah, which was in Fifth Ward. And I caught the bus out there. And when I caught the bus out there, you know, I rapped for the individuals and they liked how I sounded. And so they introduced us to James Smith. And from that point forward, the rest was history. Roger's recollection of the incident is similar. He says, a few times Prince tried to run me off, but I brought Raheem with me one day. I was beatboxing and Raheem was rapping. Uh, I was like on crush, uh, crush Groove when LL bust in the door, where Raheem bust through the door and I bust through the door and I'm beatboxing and Raheem's rapping and then he looked at us and said, y'all got a deal. Roger's pontificates, I'm the original ghetto boy because I'm the one who inspired James Spitt to invest his money in music business. I believe he was going another direction with his money. So when I came along, he told me, man, if you go to school and do what you're supposed to do, I'll make you a record. 
I went to school and he made a record and here we are today. Rap Alive began in 1986. Rogers and Raheem, who soon, uh, soon paired with K-9, Sir Rap a Lot, forming the group The Ghetto Boys. Oscar initially proposed another name, Hip Hop Vigilantes, but Polk suggested Ghetto Boys, and his, uh, his, uh, his brother Smith agreed to that idea. In 1986, together with the prodding of Smith, the Ghetto Boys wrote and recorded Car Freaks. The following line of notes are provided. Daryl Oliver, Gary Moon, Mickey Blue, who is a, uh, a soul and funk artist from Houston, and uh, the scratches were Easy C. Car Freaks is a minute and three second uh, song about women who are only interested in guys because of their cars. The group of three teenagers boast about their ride and boast about the beautiful dame who rides in their car, only to realize what she is in the car for, uh, that she's in the car for the wrong reason. The Gutter Boys' initial 12 inch offering got them radio playing shows, but their group would soon uh, face challenges. Thoth and Polk had some challenges. Raheem became disillusioned with the uh, direction of the group, so he went solo, thus becoming the first artist out of Houston signed to a major label deal, a and Records. The remaining member was Keith Rogers, but that did not mean the end of Ghetto Boys or the failure of Houston's hip-hop culture. In 1987, Rapper Locks' leader would soon recruit a DJ uh, that was uh, hanging out at clubs from Trent, New Jersey, who was in Houston staying with his sister and DJing at the Rhinestone Wrangler. This DJ then recruited his friend uh, from Trenton to Houston to audition for Smith. These two transplants, DJ Reddy Red and Prince Johnny C, would be the second lineup for the Ghetto Boys. By 1986, hip-hop culture in Houston was ready to stand on its own, and Rap Alive Records was the company that supported artists from the city in realizing their dreams. For the next five years, if you were rapping in Houston as a profession, you were most likely rapping under the umbrella of Rap Alive Records. If not, you were rapping with Shortstop Records or Big Time Records. So my question to you, Willie, really, is you know, know that history, but not many people know how uh, the most famous lineup, you, Scarface, and Bushwick came to become Ghetto Boys. If you can, and I know we, it's a, uh, we almost have to go, can you tell, us, uh, tell, tell the world a little bit about that story? I originally signed on with uh, Rap A Lot as a solo artist. I wasn't interested in getting in, into a group, because you know how that go. <laughs> Real talk. Um, so, uh, I was writing some songs for the new Ghetto Boys album. I wasn't going to be in the group. I'm just writing a couple songs. Roll Let a Ho Be a Ho. <laughs> Do It Like a G.O. So that was the first couple songs that I wrote for the group. And Jay, the owner of Rap A Lot Records, Jay Prince, he was digging the songs. He liked, uh, his friends liked it, uh, liked the songs. So he gave... Uh, Prince Johnny C and Jukebox, who was the members, of, members in the group at the time, the remaining members of the, in the group at the time, along with Reddy Red, the DJ, he gave them all ultimatum. He was like, uh, <clears throat> they didn't, um, Prince Johnny C didn't like the, like the songs. Uh, he had a wife on the Christian thing, I guess. So <laughs> he was like, man, y'all sing this stuff, man, and y'all can go solo. You know, you can sing it or go solo. So Jukebox decided he was gonna stay in the group and <clears throat> Jay was trying to figure out what he was going, what his next move was going to be. So one night he came to my house, and uh, you know he just was like, "Man, man, I want you to join the Ghetto Boys." And I was like, "No, nah, man, <laughs> I don't want to do that." So he was like, uh, "You know, can you do it as a favor?" <clears throat> Jay pretty, uh, he can be pretty convincing. You know what I'm saying? You know. I, you know how to use words <laughs> exactly the right way. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was like, well, can you do it as a favor? And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I'm going to turn that down. This man taking a chance on me. I'm a ghetto boy for real. You know, mm -hmm. he taking a chance on me. Uh, and, you know, this is a family thing, you know. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I decided I would go ahead on and, and go ahead and join the group. And so now we got myself and Jukebox as the rappers in the group. Jay told me he had this dude on the south side named DJ Action, who y'all know now as Scarface. So I was like, I had never met him before, didn't know, never heard of him. And I was like, well, okay, well. And he said, well, I want y'all to be the new members in the group. So fast forward about a month later or so, he come by my house in a van. He has 
uh, Scarface is in the van. John Beto, his producer, is in the van. Yeah. Reddy Red is in the van. Bushwick Bill is in the van. And uh, so I hop in. Jay introduced me to everybody. We get to the studio out in the country, like 45 minutes away. We, we, do, we uh, record the, the album on, uh, at the ranch, at, at Jay's ranch. We get out to the ranch. The same night, Jukebox quits the group. <laughs> he, you know, he had some personal issues, so he decided he wanted to quit the group. So now we have myself and Face as the rappers in the group. While I'm in the studio doing some writing, I look over at the corner of my eye and I see Bushwick rapping some Public Enemy songs. And a light come on. I'm like, <laughs> I started to think, I said, man, I introduced the concept to the group and you know everybody else, I was like, man, what if we put Bushwick in the group in place of Jukebox? And everybody started laughing. Cause I'm, you know, I'm a pretty, I'm, you know, people that really know me, you know, know I can be a prankster sometimes. So I was like, yeah, now nah, I'm serious. No offense, Bushwick, but if I saw a midget rapping, <laughs> yeah, especially if he was talking shit, <laughs> I said it would get my attention. So Jay was like, man, Jay was like scratching his head, like they, he was like, man. I'm, he was like, man, what you, what you think, Bushwick? Bill was like, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but I can try. So I was like, well, man, if I, if, if I write him something uh, and he said he's in the group, Jay real cautious. He like, huh? yeah, let, let's see, but let's see, man. So I took, him, I took Bushwick downstairs into the kitchen at the breakfast table, and I asked him some personal questions about himself and I embellished it with what I thought it might be like to walk in his shoes. And I came up with size ain't shit. Yeah. Three days later, Bushwick, dis Bushwick rapped the song. He delivered. And that's how Bushwick Bill became a ghetto boy. Anything other than that story is a bold-faced lie. Yeah. That is how Bushwick Bill became a ghetto boy. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you how nice of a guy I am. Before all of that happened, I got into an altercation with Bushwick in the club. Well, Bushwick bumped, bumped me. Like, like he was, Bushwick was uh, bus, busing, ta busing um, tables for, for the rhinestone when Jay owned the rhinestone on the north side. <laughs> and I'm standing in the club, I'm just hanging out with my boy and I'm you know, checking out the action. And I, and I feel a, a nudge up on you know, my back, like you know how somebody, bump you real hard and you turn around like yeah. that like I'm finna whoop somebody I turn around but I ain't see nobody <laughs> <laughs> y'all know I can't make this up this is a true story <laughs> so when I turned back around my boy did like this and he pointed at Bush with it. so Bill got the bucket and he walking with the bucket and he's like walking like that you know so <laughs> I walk up to him I say Say, little Bushwick, say, man, you just bumped into me, man. You ain't gonna say excuse me. Man, little suckers turn around like he say, get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I, hey, I turned around and I planted that left foot and I kicked Bill in the ass like I was trying to kick the winning field goal for Super Bowl 50. <laughs> and the bucket jumped, fell up, and all went up in the air, and he hit the floor and all that stuff. So, you know, a few things, was, words was exchanged and all that stuff after that. But, you know, me and Bill got off to a rocky start. <clears throat> and I ain't saying this, to, you know, to, to be messy. I'm just documenting the truth. Just like I document the truth when I talk about how I was raised and, you know, how, you know, abusive my mama was or whatever. That's painful for me, but I still share with y'all because I think the best stories uh, uh, that an artist can tell is the real story. And the so truth. that's why I'm telling y'all the real story. That's what happened. And so 
you know, being the good guy I am, I was like, I let bygones be bygones, and I saw the bigger picture. That's and I was like, Bill need to be in this group. That's how Bushwick Bill got to become a ghetto boy. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys, we, uh, we got to wrap this panel up. So. There's a lot more that can be said about those years between 1979 and 1991 before the explosion with minds playing tricks on you. Uh, but hopefully you've been able to get uh, a little more history uh, of what Houston hip hop culture was like and those factors and those people that helped create that. Uh, the broader picture of this is, uh, as Dead Prez would say, it's bigger than hip hop. Uh, this is a a story of, of, uh, of young people uh, in Houston, Texas, in a post-industrial city, uh, trying to do, like Gil Scott Heron say, who would make it in America. And they were able to make it in America by doing something that America despised. So uh, hopefully that you, uh, you've enjoyed this, uh, and uh, when texts come out in the coming years, you'll pick them up, and you'll have more information uh, to add to your uh, your, your knowledge bank of hip hop and Houston hip hop. Thank you all very much. We done. We done. We done. Thank you. We we did it. Okay. I like the, uh, for old times' sake. Uh, I like to battle Rick. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hey, but I want to thank you, Willie D, because Willie D was, was the person that called me and told me to come to this event. You're getting tired of hearing the history be left out. You know, so my name being left out in Royal Flush. So I appreciate you calling me a Mako. You. My rhymes are jingle, boy, jingling. I'm the OG, Slick Rick, and I don't talk like I'm from England, pussy. <laughs>